So yeah, I'm a, I'm a practicing child and adolescent psychiatrist. That's what I do in my day job. I've been a child and adolescent psychiatrist since 1992. So I've got a good few years uh, behind me and I've seen and been an observer of how our ideas about mental health and mental health practice and awareness have changed over time. I consider myself to be a traditional child and adolescent psychiatrist in that most of my training was in systemic thinking and an awareness that uh, young people exist in a context. Most of the important decisions about their life are not usually made by them, but by the people in various caring relationships around them. And also about an awareness of development, and I mean development in the broadest sense, that uh, things change. That as time goes by, what, you're, what you like, what you want to do, how you function, who your friends are, what your interests are, etc., they, they, they can all change. Um, in the late 1990s, I saw as there was beginning to be more infiltration into British child and adolescent psychiatry of more American, Americanized versions of child psychiatry. So there was the, the beginning of the growth of a more biomedical understanding. Um, that started with uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder as a concept started seeping in. It was something that we didn't really think about or talk about uh, previously to that. Um, and then over the last decade or so, I've witnessed um, child psychiatry or ch children and young people's mental health become culturally more, um, more talked about, more noticed. So um, we've seen the development of a number of conditions that were very marginal in my early days of practice. Things like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, autism, uh, childhood depression, uh, childhood anxiety, all of these things were not really thought about in the same way that they're thought about uh, now. And then talk of a crisis started happening from about five years ago and of course through the pandemic we've had a crisis on top of a crisis and um, young people's mental health is really quite centre stage in our culture nowadays alongside a belief and a, and a set of ideas that say that this is a big problem. This is a big problem in our society and that what we have to do is we have to learn how to intervene early or, and we have to improve young people's resilience against... Um, so there's been a real uh, drive that conceptualise young people as vulnerable to mental health problems which is all around us and that they need uh, extra help, extra support, and we need to identify these problems early because if we intervene early, we improve their um, outcomes. So schools have become a real site of concern, and I've seen this now in the growth of interventions that are targeted at school, both uh, generically but also more uh, specifically, the growth of... Um, services located in schools and targeted at schools, uh, giving therapy, running groups, running educational programs. And so my talk today is to ask this question, is this shift actually uh, resulting in any benefits? And what are the conceptual underpinnings behind this shift? Where does, um, what, what are the implications of this, uh, of this shift in, in the way we think about and understand this phenomena. I'm, uh, a, a lot of my um, earlier work in my um, uh, academic part of my, um, my life has been looking at the science behind all of these conditions. And I'm not going to talk about the science because I'm more interested in thinking about the concepts for today. Just to tell you that the, the science and the scientific knowledge that we have is no better now than it was when I first started in 1992 or than 100 years ago. We have not made any advances in understanding the genetics, biochemistry, 
uh, neuroanatomy uh, an, an anatomy or other neurological differences, there has been no real progress. That cupboard of knowledge is empty. So keep that in mind. One of the first things I often do when I do trainings with uh, various groups is ask them to, to explain to me what sort of thing, how would you define what is mental health? What is mental disorder? What is mental illness? Can you come up with a definition for that? I'm not going to ask you now, but if you just ponder for just a few minutes on that question, you realize, and this is the thing that happens with uh, any group that I'm involved in doing some training and asking this question, you cannot escape subjectivity in trying to define it. You do not have an empirical anchor in which to connect your definitions. So, literally, when we've been talking about mental health and mental uh, health awareness, we do not know what we're talking about. Literally, we have no idea what it is that we're talking about. And yet, we've created this whole facade and whole structure um, of services, and campaigns based on the idea that we do know what mental health is. And so I want to spend a little bit of time unpicking this, and I'm picking this in particular in relation to something that has become very prevalent and has become part of the way that we're expected to practice <coughs> in my profession that certainly wasn't part of the way we were expected to practice when I first started. And that is to ask the question of, what do we mean by a diagnosis? And why I'm uh, asking this is because we've come to imagine that diagnosis in psychiatry, because we use the word diagnosis, has a similar status as diagnosis in the rest of medicine. But diagnosis basically is a system of classification. It's a system of nosology. And it's a system of classification based on an understanding of a proximal cause. So we don't just talk about diagnostics in medicine. We also talk about diagnosis. Um, you know, uh, our IT department at work, they sometimes run diagnostic checks because they're trying to understand the cause of something. Car mechanics sometimes run diagnostic checks. Diagnosis is a system of classification related to an understanding of a proximal cause. And that's how it works in the rest of medicine. And that's how we, as the general public, tend to understand what it means. So if you have an accident and you have a, you know, you've, you've uh, got a swelling in your leg and you can't wait there and you go for an x-ray and there's a, a break in your uh, tibia or fibula, which is the two bones down here, um, you understand the reason why you can't wait there and why there is uh, a swelling and pain in your leg. So your suffering is linked to something that goes external to the imagination of the person doing the diagnosis. Make sense? What it means now is that you can build a system of technical knowledge. And I'm not going to deal with all the shortcomings, because there's a huge amount of shortcomings in relation to diagnosis in the rest of medicine and what it leaves out and, and the aspect that, you know, healthcare involves a human social relationship and involves experiences of suffering and so on. But just, if I can just use the simplicity of, uh, of the generalizations I'm making, hopefully it will help you understand the difference between a diagnostic nosology and what we have in psychiatry. So you can now build a system of knowledge based around an understanding of fractures. So you can look at different types of fractures. You can look at different types of treatments related to those fractures. You can look at different types of associated complications, other medical conditions that might make you more likely to have fractures and so on, because you've got an empirical anchor. You've got something external to the person doing the diagnosis that you can link to the symptoms that they're experiencing. 
Um, similarly, diabetes. Now, if we look at if we look at diabetes and compare it to what we have in psychiatry, you might begin to get an idea of what I mean here. So, uh, diabetes is defined as blood sugar that's uh, at too high a level. Um, it is not defined by reference to a description of the sorts of things that might lead the doctor to suspect that you might have diabetes. So it is not defined by being too thirsty, going to the toilet a lot and feeling fatigue. Because diabetes may not present like that. It may present just with a tendency to get infections. I'm particularly talking about type 2 diabetes. Or it might not present until you, you're in a diabetic coma. Um, but also, other conditions may present with the same sorts of experiences. So, what you need to do when somebody presents like that is in order to understand what the reasons are for them presenting like that, you'd need to run things like a, a random blood sugar, or you can take um, test the urine for blood sugar or for ketones, or you might do a fasting blood sugar. So you're trying to establish something that has an empirical anchor. So the definition of diabetes is not descriptive. It is related to something specific and empirical. Follow me? Now see what happens when you ask the question, what is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? The only thing you can do to support that is to describe it. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is literally the presence of um, uh, levels of inattention, hyperactivity and impulsivity that's considered to be develop developmentally inappropriate. In other words, it's a description. Um, and you can understand a bit further why this is not a diagnosis if you try to treat it as if it is a diagnosis, which is actually what happens in practice. So people are often say, that the reason this child is hyperactive and poor, has poor attention is because they have ADHD, because they have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. But a legitimate question to come back to that is to, to then ask, how do you know it's the ADHD causing the hyperactivity and inattention? Well, the only answer you can give to that is I know it's ADHD because they have hyperactivity and inattention. So we get into this confusing tautology. It's, it's the same as saying, uh, th saying that your, your unhappiness is caused by depression is akin to saying the pain in your head is caused by a headache. A description does not cause itself. But that is exactly how we've, how we've been using it, as if we know what we're talking about. We're creating a, a, um, a, a tautology which might be okay if we understood that's what we were doing. But most of the time we don't. We seem to imagine that we've captured something that is akin to capturing something like diabetes. And, uh, and, and if you take that analogy a bit further, it would be a bit like um, going to your doctor with a, a cough that you've had for two weeks. And the doctor takes down, you know, talks to you for a while and takes the history of the cough and how long you've had it and associated features. Etc. And then comes back to you and says, you've got a recurrent cough disorder. That would be, that would be what would be the akin of using diagnosis in the manner we use it in psychiatry if we used it in the rest of medicine. You'd be struck off as a doctor quite rightly because, and you know, when we go to the doctor and we've got a chest pain, we want to understand the cause of it. We want to know the diagnosis because we're going to uh, feel relieved if we are, are eventually discover that the cause of it is acid reflux as opposed to a problem in your heart. That is the purpose of diagnosis and a classification system based on diagnosis. So in a well-functioning uh, system of classification based on diagnosis, you can build 
technical knowledge around that diagnosis. If all you have is description, but you're treating it as if it is a diagnosis, your technical knowledge is as flimsy as the starting points with which you have started. It's worse than that because it's giving the illusion that you've actually discovered something and this something it has a concrete presence in the same way that a fracture in the leg has a concrete presence. So you start talking about, I have ADHD. Well, you can't have ADHD in the same way that you have a broken leg. It's a, it's a descriptive label. So literally, when you're not hyperactive, you don't have ADHD. If you're running around like a headless chicken, for those moments, you could say you have ADHD because it's a description. You follow me? <coughs> but what has happened is we're treating these things that are more like acts of faith, as if they are uh, acts of um, discovery of a scientific nature. So this is what we refer to as scientism. And scientism is rippling around. There are two types of scientism, the, in my view. Well, there, there are many ways. One is the idea and the belief that you need a scientific method to understand something. And of course, for many of you as philosophers, you know that science represents a particular ontology with particular epistemologies attached to it. But it's the, uh, the spread of this idea that you can use science to discover all sorts of things, including how our mind works, or how our emotions works, or uh, all sorts of things that maybe science might not be, the, the epistemology of science might not be the best place to help us uncover. But there's the other bit of scientism, which is the ignoring of the actual scientific findings and treating something as if there has been a scientific discovery when there hasn't. And so we've got both of those operating in the field of psychiatry. And by the way, as a psychiatrist, I see psychiatry as the philosophical branch of medicine, because we have no choice but to get engaged in meanings. What does a good life mean? What is the nature of experience? What is the nature of reality? <laughs> These are the questions that confront us in our, in our practice. <clears throat> um, again, just re-illustrating these points, if you look at what is considered... Is there a pointer here? Yeah, there is, but it doesn't work on there. Um, the, the, what is considered to be a case, so even just looking at what is... Consi these get classified as symptoms when you talk diagnostically. But look at the first word in a p what is meant to be symptoms. So this is how you go about making a diagnosis. The word often comes in front of every. Now these, depending on your framework for interpretation, you could see these as experiences, you could see them as behaviours, but in this system of, uh, of classifying you see them as decontextualised symptoms. In other words, they belong to that individual, and then you have to make a judgment. So look at the third one. Often fidgets with hands or feet or squirms in their seat. How often is often? Is it once a minute? Is it once every 10 minutes, once an hour? What's a unit of squirm <laughs> or a unit of fidget? Yeah? So. Um, and, and diagnosis is based on these. So you, you just can't escape subjectivity. You can't escape the fact that you have to have an interpretive framework. There is not a diagnostic framework there. And you're already making all sorts of assumptions when you start to think of these in terms of symptoms. These are big conceptual jumps. And what it's resulted in, <coughs> so this is now a bit more going into my 
speculations about some of the consequences for us as a society, for us as cultures, and what it might relate to. So we've had a massive expansion of what I call human typologies. The idea that we've seen this expand in all sorts of um, in all sorts of areas. So um, I've had a number of management um, positions over the years uh, in my work. And the first time I had one, I had to, I was sent on this training at um, Kiel University, who do this kind of management for NHS consultants. Um, and, uh, and it was all pop psychology, as far as I could see. But one of the things that they do there is you have to fill in these questionnaires to show what type of manager that you're going to be. And they have, uh, you know, what's it, the Robert, Rob, Robinson Myers, Myers Briggs. There's a number of other ones. There's one with Robinson in it as well. Yeah, Myers Briggs. They have a number of these. Uh, so it's all over the place. You get them in interviews for jobs these days. So there's this idea that we have certain characteristics that belong to us that are, have, have nothing to do with the context that we're in, have nothing to do with the uh, pressures that come from externally that are, are kind of uh, there as, as static and continuous. So this, this idea that there is a, a, a widening remit of human um, uh, typology. And it accompanies, as far as I can see, a narrowing of the conception of what it means to be an ordinary. Or I prefer the word ordinary to normal, because think of the um, <coughs> dialectical opposite to normal. And think of the dialectical opposite to ordinary. So we've got extraordinary or abnormal. So I don't like the word uh, normal. I prefer the word ordinary. But it's, it's shrinking. It's similarly, it's shrinking for parents. What it, what it means to be just an okay parent. There's so many more pressures on so many more ideas about what you should and shouldn't be uh, um, as a parent and about how your children should and shouldn't be behaving, performing, etc., etc. So this is the, the kind of reality that we seem unable in a world of scientism that's tr striving for uh, certainty to face. That when it comes to um, understanding what happens for us as human beings, we can measure various inputs, relational, environmental, we can do all sorts of you know, sociological research making connections. We can also measure various outputs in terms of talking about the experiences people have or the behaviours that they have. But that bit in the middle, the only thing we have, it's a big black box. It's not been revealed anything by psychology, I would argue, because psychology as we have it now is, is I would argue, is a very narrow version of Western educated population psychology. And it's not being revealed by neuroscience. Uh, we just have a big black box in which we transplant our framework for understanding that bit in the middle. And so what we have, essentially, so for me as a practicing psychiatrist, we have models. So we, we try to help make sense of something. But our different models that we use, rather than discovering the correct meanings, we are in the business of creating meanings, and the meanings we create have different consequences. There are different cons consequences if you interpret somebody's uh, particular behaviour as being the product of something called ADHD, as if you interpret it as being the product of a very lively mind, or if you interpret it as being the product of uh, uh, distress because of what's going on at home, etc., etc. So we have different models, and the different models we use have consequences. 
And the problem with the model that has become so dominant is it's leading in the way that um, Lucy spoke about in the morning. As I've, I've also got a slide on Ian hacking and looping, as I think it's a very useful con way of understanding this, is that it's leading to a, a rapid growth in the numbers of people who are getting diagnosis, who are getting therapy, who are getting all sorts of psychotropic medication, whose evidence basis in terms of long-term outcomes is, is not only that they do not lead to better outcomes, but quite often they lead to worse outcomes. Um, and it's leading to big changes in the way young people think about themselves and their experiences. So in a survey pre-pandemic in 2019 of 1,000 young people, 68% of them thought they had a mental health problem or have had a mental health problem. And 62% of those thought it was destigmatization campaigns that helped them identify it. So we're really pushing out into, and that's not far off of academic studies that use um, child report uh, questionnaire, so the, the you know young people themselves are filling in questionnaires. So, a 2019 one published said that 42% of 11 to 15 year olds, based on their um, their uh, uh, responses to the questions used, ident were likely to have, according to this research, a mental health disorder. So, we're getting to the point where it is out of the ordinary or extraordinary if you don't have a mental disorder. Some people might think that's a good thing. Um, I'm not so sure. And I think this connects very, almost directly to the nature of the economy that structures our society, so our economy is based on the principles of compare and compete. The, uh, and, and so it's not surprising if those values seep into our way of structuring our human understanding of ourselves and the nature of our relationships. And one of the things that um, keeps an economy like this going is the process of commodification. In other words, turning something into uh, something that can be bought and sold. And so we've had widespread, I, I see all of this mental health um, destigmatization campaigns as getting very hooked up with commodification processes. And what you find when things get commodified is once there is a market for it, it will expand and the products related to that will expand along with it. And the two areas that are very, very amenable to commodification are children and their behavior and adults and their um, emotional life and concepts of self. So these are the two areas that, that grow and grow. So we've seen a rapid expansion in those attached to ideas of, of behavior problems, so ADHD and autism. And also, we then see them, ADHD and autism, expand into the adult population, but they're the, the main um, cus consumer base it tends to shift towards uh, those who are, um, uh, they, they tend to shift genders, and they tend to shift conceptually more to, um, uh, less about behavior and more about feelings about the self and how, you, how well you fit in. Um, and the opposite has happened with concepts like depression and anxiety, which were mainly related to the adult populations, and they've now seeped into the young people. Uh, and so these become expanded markets. So by market, I mean not just um, the obvious ones like pharmaceuticals, but you get books, 
uh, you get the self-help stuff, you get courses, you get um, films, you get institutes, you get research. All of these things start to grow um, products. And, and just thinking about all the different things that have, that have expanded and continue to expand, uh, ideas about what gender expression is, diagnoses, what is traumatic, the idea of uh, things being traumatic have, have expanded. Um, types of, th there, there are now over 400 different types of therapy schools um, and various typologies. So this is what I think happens in a market culture, which is very individualized, of course, and focuses on the idea of the individual and the individual and what, what makes a um, individual most productive in this culture and economy. Um, but there is an, uh, so I've deconstructed the scientific basis and some of the uh, implications of that. But there is another important question to ask, which is perhaps this trick of classification, so the use of diagnosis has actually been useful and it's enabled more people to live better lives. Um, I can't present you all the evidence, but the answer is no. Uh, I'm not going to beat around the bush. Here's, here's a couple of studies of a, a very unusual type. Um, I, I haven't seen many studies. I've been looking for studies like this, and I wish there would be more of them. But two distinct studies, one with um, uh, a group of Irish children and one with a group of um, Australian children, they uh, piggybacked onto a longitudinal epide epidemiological study. So this was um, where they take a cross-section of a particular group in society. Some of them will then get a diagnosis and they've been filling in questionnaires at certain points and then you follow them up and see what happens. So both of these ha had a similar methodology. In other words, um, uh, in both of these studies, there was a group of children who got a diagnosis of ADHD, but there was another group of children who had a similar level of inattention and hyperactivity who didn't get that diagnosis. And the people who did get the diagnosis in the Irish study, by the time they were 13, where they got their diagnosis at an average age of nine, so four years later, those who did get a diagnosis compared to those who didn't but had similar levels of inattention and hyperactivity, showed more emotional peer relationship problems, worse post-social behavior, and poorer self-concept. And that was very similar to the study in Australia, which uh, followed children for um, six to seven years um, until they were 14 or 15 years old and showed a similar set of things, that those who got a diagnosis seem to be doing worse on a number of dimensions. Uh, these studies didn't look to what treatment they did or didn't have, it was just that was the question that they were asking. Similarly, we have an issue with um, what is happening with autism and autism diagnoses. As w uh, even though there is a understanding that what should happen is that employers should be more able to make accommodations and to uh, be able to work with these different um, challenges that people may have. Um, I think the evidence is very thin on the ground that that is actually what happens. And I think people kind of need to, need to know about that. For a start, there are certain professions such as if you wanted to go into the military or the police, that automatically excludes people with certain diagnoses, including um, autism diagnoses. Um, but the figures nationally, and I've heard recently that somebody's done research recently and found that these were figures from 2018, which showed that 15% of adults were, with an ASD diagnosis are in full-time employment. I think the figure is, is not that much difference now. So, you know, what, what, does, what, what does that all mean? If you look at things like um, 
the numbers of people who are claiming disability allowances for a health problem, what we've seen is those who have a, um, uh, a what is characterized uh, or, or what is uh, categorized rather as a mental health problem, the numbers are going steadily up. In this country, the numbers of people who were categorized as um, needing disability allowance for a mental health problem overtook all the other categories in 2011. Um, and um, whilst many of the other categories were gradually going down, the next biggest category w was, I think, due to back, back problems, and there might be issues about recategorizing people. Um, <coughs> but that has continued to rise, and 50% of that is to do with the diagnosis of, uh, of depression. And of course, many of these people who do get these diagnoses disproportionately come from the lower uh, economic strata of society, people who are uh, experiencing all sorts of economic and social challenges uh, in their life, but they are becoming categorized as mental um, health issues. Uh, and we see this around the, the Western world. Wherever we've increased the amount of um, uh, availability of mental health treatments and mental health diagnoses have become more common, we see a simultaneous increase in the numbers of people who are claiming disability benefits because of a mental health problem. So that is not the t sort of picture that you would see if there was uh, types of interventions that were, um, in medical terms, uh, thought of as being successful. Uh, for example, we, we know things like um, the survival from various types of cancers has improved. There have been various types of treatments related to uh, uh, cardiovascular condition, which has resulted in, in improved survivability um, and so on. So this is not the picture we would find out, uh, we would uh, see if we were similarly improving outcomes through the interventions that we provide. And it's the same with child and adolescent mental health. There's very little uh, evidence there that our interventions lead to, at a population level, to improved outcomes for those who access them. The, the various medications we use, well, they are basically a mixture of uppers and downers. They have no specific diagnosis specific effect. Being called antidepressants is just a marketing thing. Uh, it's a marketing category. There's no such thing as an antidepressant. So the most commonly prescribed antidepressants are called serotonin reuptake inhibitors. That's all they do. They increase the amount of availability of a certain neurotransmitter, which does have uh, effects on your mental state, but these are generic effects. They are no different to the way alcohol has effects on uh, generically. Um, and you can argue that uh, for certain people, when they are under the influence of alcohol, they might have a bit more social courage than they are not, but for others it might be quite different. They might become more disturbed, more violent, more suicidal. This is no different to the sorts of things that we have in, um, in, uh, in psychiatry. The main difference between the drugs we use in psychiatry and the drugs that you can find on the street is that they're prescribed by a doctor. And our therapies, um, with the exception, I would say, of certain branches of psychoanalysis and certain um, systemic theory, and systemic theory has always been, my, has been one of the areas of my interest because it looks at issues of power and knowledge production and, and these things which I think are important. But most of the popular therapies that we have, as far as I can see, they're just Western folk psychology infused with scientism. If you look at the most popular one um, that's regularly talked about, cognitive behavior therapy, well, if you look at the theory of cognitive behavior therapy, it's the idea 
that you have certain thoughts that come into your mind that um, create negative feelings and so the, the site of action is that you're trying to get somebody to challenge those thoughts like a little scientist um, and uh, replace them with more useful thoughts. It's kind of pull yourself together now. If you look at behavior therapy, another one, I think it can be summarized in the, um, in the phrase, face your fears. That's basically what it is, face your fears. Um, I was talking to somebody uh, who's not, a, not in the mental health field, you know, about different therapies and so on. I was talking to them about counseling and I was explaining counseling and things like that. And they looked at me and they said, so you're saying counselling is about listening to somebody talk about their problems. And I thought, yeah, that's probably about the sum of it. So most of these, they, they don't really go beyond what is common. And if you think about cognitive behaviour therapy in particular, it comes from a very mechanistic idea about how humans work, how they, how they operate. And it's the very same sort of mechanistic ideas that used in the pop psychology of managers and in management. So it's, a ver it's very concordant with uh, a kind of neoliberal philosophy towards how we conceive of humans and how we conceive of relationships. Um, my daughter did a... Um, uh, a little research project as part of her undergraduate dissertation where she interviewed 19 teachers who had to have been teaching for at least five years or more um, in secondary schools just to, to ask them about their thoughts and beliefs about mental health. What is it? How do you deal with it? How do you identify it? What's happening in your school with it? Has this changed over time? And um, basically what she found is that all the teachers um, said that they now understood that behaviours and experiences they would have previously not thought of as being mental health issues, they now understand them to be mental health issues. Um, what they thought caused mental health issues were very much in terms of everyday stuff, psychosocial challenges, family, stress, relationships, exams, social media, etc., etc. But at the same time, so they used a very psychosocial model, but in terms of interventions or in terms of what you should do about that, they very much drew on an expert-led idea. In fact, things had shifted so much that the several teachers gave examples of being worried about intervening in ordinary ways because they don't have the knowledge or expertise. So they increasingly saw their role as identifying people and referring them on. And as a result, despite the fact that services had expanded enormously, and this took place in my county, so I know how services have expanded both in child and adolescent mental health but also in terms of input directly into schools and actually they, they all identified that they have more people in their pastoral support than they used to have, is that, um, uh, so there was one example that I remember for it, is that um, a teacher talked about a young person coming to them who was very distressed, in tears, talking about something, and they sat them down and they talked to them, and the young person went away and seemed to be okay. The next day he, they checked in with them and they seemed to be okay. But then he told their manager, his line manager, that that's what they'd done. And the line manager, she told him off and said, you shouldn't have done that because for all you know, they have a serious problem uh, or um, you don't have the expertise to know you should have asked um, to talk to our pastoral support and they may have needed a referral. So, this process of expertising and of detaching ourselves from the idea of ordinariness, of struggle, of, of distress, is really, really been taking on. Um, and what it leads to, I think, is in this culture of mental health awareness, we now fear 
the struggles and the emotional intensity of, that's associated with growing up. Um, I, I often say to people that I'm, I, I, I'm not particularly religious, but I say, I really hope, I really hope that there is no such thing as reincarnation, because I would hate to go through my adolescence again. You know, growing up is tough. Um, but if you're making those struggles of growing up and trying to figure out what things mean to you, what your place in the world, what's of value, etc., etc., and if we turn those into potential signs of mental disorders that require some expert to fiddle about with your, your emotional dysregulation, I always wonder what emotional regulation looks like, or your, um, your uh, negative automatic thoughts, um, what impact does that have on people's growing, on people's chances of growing up with some degree of resilience, some degree of depth towards appreciating the nature of the human condition. Um, and so this is, this is really what, what we have. We've got emotions, but we're always imposing and the different ways we impose meanings on those emotional experiences have profound effects on their outputs. And I'll just finally finish with just briefly talking about a process that I've seen from clinical practice, which I find disturbing. <coughs> and I think this culture of mental health awareness is a significant contributor to. And the best way to, or one of the ways to help you understand what I mean is for you to think about insomnia, because we all experience insomnia. I've experienced insomnia. And the, the first uh, few days of insomnia, when you get it, is usually because there's something on your mind. It might be something you're excited about. More often, it's something you're worried about. You can't get off your mind. Maybe you've had an argument, had a fallout. You can't get to sleep. After a number of days of insomnia, what do you start to worry about when you go to sleep? You start to worry about whether you're going to fall asleep. Yeah? You start to think about, oh my God, you start looking at your clock. It's an hour has gone and I'm still not asleep. I have to get up at seven o'clock in the morning. There's only six hours left at night. I don't do well on six hours, etc., etc. Now, if that problem carries on, um, you're into the process where insomnia effectively starts to cause itself. So insomnia becomes the cause of insomnia. And if you, if you try then, now that you've categorized it as a problem in your life, if you try then to make a solution to it, so you, know, you, you try a different thing at night, a different routine, um, maybe have some music or whatever it is you try, and it either goes away but comes back again, or it doesn't go, uh, go away, you now have a concept that this problem is even bigger than I thought it was. You might then go to the GP, you might get medication, um, and, and at each stage, this is getting into a bigger and bigger problem. Um, and in some ways, the challenge that it's left, so just replace the word in, insomnia with depression, with anxiety, with any, any disorder you want, and you can see how when we start talking of these experiences as being somehow in the realm of a problem, and a problem that needs a solution, this process of expansion can take place. Um, and one of the things that uh, has, has really informed my clinical practice since I've become more aware of this process and that since I've seen it with so many young people who are really convinced that they have some awful disorder that they're trying to get rid of and that they're now in a struggle against an aspect of themselves that they either feel that they have to control or have to get rid of or, or have to minimize in some way is actually bringing that back because um, in a paradoxical way as long as you have categorized insomnia as a problem needing a solution there is now the danger for this process to take place if instead 
you categorize it as an, a, an event that is part of the ordinariness of being human, trying to deal with pressures, it means that where if you get a good night's sleep, great. If you don't get a good night's sleep, uh, you know, life can be shit. Um, uh, ask any, any, young, any young parent about how good the human, uh, human beings are at still functioning despite having very little sleep, you know? So if, you, if instead you see it as part of the spectrum of experiences that human beings have, instead of a problem needing a solution, you're into a different framework. And that is one of the challenges now, that all of this nonsense of mental health awareness that we've had is creating a, a, a group of people who are suffering unnecessarily because meaningful, ordinary, understandable human experiences are being turned into something that humans shouldn't experience. So it's being turned into meaningless torture for people to endure rather than people to incorporate into their experience of being human. And that's it. So get rid of mental health awareness campaigns. They're terrible. <laughs>